We're back here on the Morning Brew and we start with the first of our news making segments this morning. The spotlight on the crime situation in this country, uh, particularly over the past week or so. Some really grisly headlines when it comes to murders. And apart from that, within the last couple days, some shocking headlines with regard to weapons caches, huge weapons caches being found and found in places of business. To put a, a perspective on this, we've got with us criminologist Dr. Wendell Wallace on the show. Good morning to you, Dr. Wallace. Good morning, Jessamy. Good morning to the viewing audience. Uh, thanks for having me this morning. The news broke yesterday about another major weapons cache found. Um, your immediate reaction to hearing about the find? Uh, well, Jessamy, my immediate reaction uh, to this latest find was one of um, dismay, but yet I am not particularly surprised in that the criminal elements, they have always tried to use these um, methods, these strategies to import uh, heavy artillery into various jurisdictions. Uh, my dismay, my, my surprise stems from the fact that such large cache of um, weapons could be imported into the country and there could only be, uh, the, the, in terms of the aim, there could only be aimed at reaching one population. That's not the law enforcement, that's not police. Those were for persons on the street and that would uh, lead to serious uh, firepower being on the street and out of the hands of the police. Mm. Dr. Wallace, you know, when you see the extensive listing of what they found, and um, the, I mean, these are weapons of warfare, and one wonders, yes. is it that someone intends to stage a coup or something like that? Because I cannot understand the need for such powerful artillery. Well, just me, I would think that um, that cash or those um, large, the large quantity of weapons that were found over the past week or so, I would not go as far as saying that they, they were destined for um, something as large as, as a coup. I, I would not be the one to make such a bold prediction. Certainly, I think that it's aimed uh, for the criminal element, for the continuation of what we have been seeing, the fight uh, for turf, the, the, the fight for, for, for power among the guns. And we must keep in mind, we must keep in mind that Trinidad and Tobago is a transshipment point based on our location between um, the, the Americas, uh, that, that transshipment zone. So we must understand that wherever you have drugs, there will be guns. Mm. Um, this, this hole that they got yesterday uh, in Coover would have been hidden in some washing machines. Uh, the hole from uh, the bond at the airport, um, you know, these, these weapons are coming through what you would consider to be legitimate spaces. Uh, they're being hidden in, in, in the containers for legitimate businesses. This is, this is insanity, Dr. Wallace. Something is wrong somewhere. Yes, just me. Um, just me, are you hearing me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, I'm saying that the fact that the, the, the criminal element uh, they are using legitimate means to import such large quantity of, of firepower. It sends a signal to the law-abiding citizens. It sends a signal to law enforcement. It sends a signal to police officers that the criminal element, they continue to try to be one step ahead in terms of their ingenious attempts at, at importation of, of firearms. It is indeed very disturbing, but as I said earlier, it is not really surprising. I have looked at, for example, the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's one of the methods that the criminal element that they try to use. They try to disguise the illegal, um, the illegal weapons, the illegal stock through legitimate uh, businesses. In terms of this weaponry, clearly um, that fighting for turf that you mentioned earlier, 
uh, this was supposed to assist with that uh, as, as one uh, criminal enterprise fights the other for control of, of the spoils, as it were, which means more murders, some of them even more grisly than what we would have seen within the past few days. Some of the, the, the headlines we would have read, drive-by shooting, um, shot while escaping attempted robbery, gunned down in La Hoqueta, uh, decapitated body found, um, man, man hit by a stray bullet when, when things were going down. Those are the kinds of, of, of headlines that we saw within the last week. And I guess we can expect to see more of this happening in the country, Dr. Wallace? Yes, yes, indeed. That, that's, my, that's my point and that's my position. Now, when you look at the history of pandemics, lockdowns, etc., and, and I have been doing that. In fact, I've been conducting some research looking at what happens during pandemics and lockdowns, etc. What you find happening is that when you have the, the, that, that initial phase, phase one where you have the lockdown, generally the population goes into a sort of shock right and you find that people will comply with the laws and that tends to cause the crime levels to go down and that normally occurs i'm not going to put a specific period on it but generally one to three months you find that happening and after a while the the, the elements the criminal elements they get fatigued at you know being cooped up the police begin to get um, fatigued and begin not to enforce the law as rigidly as in the initial phase. So we now into phase two. And what you find happening in phase two is as a result of that fatigue in phase one, um, people start adopting an approach that says, I don't care. And that's when you get the spike. And the third phase is when law enforcement, when the police reacts to that spike, and then you tend to have you tend to have a bit of a leveling off or a lessening of crime. So, so what's happening now is that the population, police officers as well as uh, the ordinary citizens, they've begun to feel that sense of fatigue and exhibiting the I don't care behaviors. So it seems as though we bring back to to, to, to life as normal. In, in terms of criminal patterns. So I certainly, I am on the lookout for more and more of the type of crimes that we saw within the past two weeks, and then law enforcement uh, will step in, the police will step in, and hopefully we will see a lowering uh, and a lessening of that type of crime, Jesse. That's just my take on it from a researcher's perspective. Of course, everything is being complicated by the fact that we're currently experiencing a surge in COVID-19 cases in the country. So our police officers, they've been hit by COVID-19, but it seems as though the criminal element, you know, don't seem to be affected by COVID-19 at all, <laughs> Dr. Wallace. Well, yes, certainly we, we know that the police officers are being hit because they are on the front line and they would be interacting um, with a host of individuals um, in terms of the criminal element, uh, they can play it a bit safer because they do not have that need to necessarily be there and interacting outside of their, their comfort zones. Uh, so clearly you are seeing that uh, police officers, um, they're being affected. And, and this, Jessime, is not only locally or regionally, it, it's an international phenomenon so that um yes the the criminal element appears not to have been hit um or affected by the covid and mind you they are always on the lookout for opportunities to to, to perpetuate uh their behaviors <laughs> What recommendations would you want to give to the newly installed National Security Minister and the, um, the crime fighting and law enforcement apparatus um, that we have in place right now? 
Um, well, Justine, that would that those recommendations can take us the entire morning for me to discuss um, <laughs> what recommendations we can put in place. Your number but one so, recommendation. <laughs> well, certainly what, what I have seen thus far, one of the things that I've always been mentioning and I've always asked uh, respective ministers of national security, probably from 2006 when I began my journey as a criminologist, I've always asked, why don't we have a police marine branch? And they have tried to spin that ball in several different ways. But I'm happy to say that now I'm seeing a return of something resembling the police marine branch. What happens, Jessime, is that our physical borders are extremely, extremely weak. They are porous. And one of the first steps we need to take is to, to strengthen our borders. And we can't rely on the Coast Guard alone. As a matter of fact, the, the role of the Coast Guard is not to conduct policing. We have islands of Trinidad and Tobago, and I frequently ask police officers, tell me when was the last time you went to Monas Islands to conduct um, a patrol? When was the last time you went to Little Tobago or Shaka Shakari to conduct a patrol? And these, this... Um, is the major weakness in my estimation, our extremely porous borders. So for, 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 um, for me, my number one recommendation to the Minister of National Security would be to ensure that our borders, our physical borders, are strengthened. And then everything else would flow from that, Jesse B. Mm. Dr. Wallace, we want to thank you for your time with us on the show this morning, and we appreciate your expertise and perspective. Uh, we will keep in touch because, as you know, crime, uh, not only does it pay, but it, it happens every day. So um, thanks so much for chatting with us this morning. Uh, thanks uh, for having me, Jessamy. It's always a pleasure. That was our first newsmaker on the show this morning, uh, criminologist Dr. Wendell Wallace.